Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our chats with Emily. That's what we're calling our readings through the Johnson edition of the Collected Poems of Emily Dickinson. We turn now to poem 233, The Lamp Burns Sure Within. Now, this is uh, another poem, I believe, possibly, about poetry and poetic writing, and more particularly, I think, inspiration. Um, it's another metaphor poem, as we have referred to several of these. Our assumption is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, Chats with Emily, our playlist. I'm hopeful that you've already worked with our preceding introductory set of comments, as well as our preceding 232 poems. We just finished with 232. The, the sun uh, just um, um, touched the morning. As we look now at, uh, at this little poem, we're going to be in interested in the way in which Emily wants to talk about lamps burning and the oil that's necessary for those lamps burning. We forget often that Emily didn't have electricity the way we have it. So, for example, that lamp, if it's going to burn, has to have oil. It has to have, of course, the wick trimmed and all that kind of stuff. Somebody's got to do that work. It'll be interesting in this poem that that somebody will be referenced as a serf first and then a slave twice. By the way, this will be the only time that Emily ever mentions slave or slavery in all of her 1,775 poems. She obviously understood the complexities of the abolitionist movement and slavery and all of that, and yet she rarely mentions it in her poetry. Um, here will be one of those moments. Now, the great scholar of Emily's work, Ruth Miller, will say that this burning lamp that Emily's referring to has something probably to do with Emily's writing of her own poetry, possibly the inspiration that's there. Let's enjoy the poem. The lamp burns sure within, though serfs supply the oil, it matters not the busy wick at her phosphoric toil. The slave forgets to fill the lamp, burns golden on, unconscious that the oil is out as that the slave is gone. Now I find this a fascinating poem. By the way, do you remember uh, when we met poem 174, it ran like this, at last to be identified, at last the lamps upon thy side, the rest of life to see, past midnight, past the morning star, past sunrise, ah, what leagues there were between our feet and day. We're back to this idea of the lamp. Notice here we're going to go from burning sure to being busy to being golden. Watch. The lamp burns sure within. Now, I think sure is the key word of this poem, and I think here we're talking about confidence on some level, right? So notice, the lamp burns. Some would say sure here is of its own, uh, without any understanding of what else is going on. The serfs, again, of course here, servants, later it'll be slaves, supply the oil. Here you could make the argument that we're really playing around with Melville's Moby Dick and the whole fact that we killed all those whales so that we could get their oil from the blubber, right? Notice the serfs, the workers supply the oil. It matters not, it's an important phrase here, the busy, and I think that's the key word of the poem, wick. In other words, uh, a, a lamp burns, uh, no question. Emily sat probably and looked at her lamp and thought, you know, it's kind of weird how the lamp does the lamp thing of burning, and it's not completely clear to the wick all of the other machinations that will support the burning of, uh, of the oil. In other words, uh, there's only one thing and the wick is busy being the wick. Again, some have read this as poetic inspiration, especially Emily's busy poetic inspiration. At her phosphoric toil, this toil, in other words, this work that's being done. In other words, there's an interconnection here where both parties are doing its job but neither party really understands what the other one is doing. From serfs we go to slaves. And again, this can be a somewhat troubling reading of this poem because Emily just kind of assumes that slaves will do slaves' work and no one really pays any attention to the work of the slaves, right? Um, and again, serfs and slaves only get used one time in her poetry and it's here. The slave forgets to fill. Now this is interesting, right? The lamp burns golden on. Now all of a sudden this poem becomes kind of complicated. Wait a minute. This is impossibility. Lamps can't burn without oil. 
right? Notice here, the slave will forget to fill the oil, and now the lamp burns. Notice we go from sure to golden. Golden on, and then a word that will make us think, obviously, of Carl Jung and Freud, no question, unconscious. In 13 different poems, she'll use this word unconscious. I would very much recommend that you run that to ground. That the oil is out as that the slave is gone. Um, in other words, what is she saying here? Well, it really doesn't seem to matter whether she has oil or not. This lamp, we could say Emily, will continue to work on regardless. Some have read this as a, uh, a recognition that it really doesn't matter whether people like Sam Boyles ever accept my poetry or not, or the critics understand how good, how good my poetry is. I don't care. I'm going to burn on. The lamp will continue to burn, and obviously we are at poem 230, uh, 233, and we have obviously 1,775 total poems by Emily. So obviously she kept writing, if you will. At 2A, what are we going to do with a message here? I think she's making the argument, I think, that focused work, busy, if you will, busy work, focused work, on a goal is a joy, and it really doesn't ma matter what else is happening around, uh, around the poet. At to be, I love the word choices here of sure to uh, bury, uh, uh, busy to golden, but I'm also disturbed by her use of the word slave. It's almost a cavalier throwaway word here. It's almost as if she just doesn't seem to care and the slave is gone. But I think there's something else going on here. I think that Emily is actually often in her poetry, as we've said. She's channeling that King James version of the Bible that she read growing up. And I think there's an interesting study here to be made. I'll only... I'll only gesture at it, but there's a little parable in Matthew 25, 1 through 13, that I'm certain is in some way standing behind much of this uh, poetic venture. I'll just read it for you, and this is the King James Version that she would have known. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them are wise, and five were foolish. They were the foolish, they that were foolish, took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom uh, tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were ready, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you knew not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now I think there is some of this parable here uh, in uh, standing behind some of the uh, lines. Notice as well, the slave is gone, the last word of the poem. And finally at 3b, how can you own a poem like this? When was a time when you enjoyed busy work? And to what degree is your life structured in such a way? so that you really don't fully appreciate all of the work that's being done behind the scenes often even to make sure that your life remains busy. I hope Emily's challenging you here. Thank you.